My name is Steven Joseph Bama, and I'm an oil painter, and my company is Classic Horrors. When did you start oil painting? Since I was probably like nine or 10, I actually found in the basement, my mom had an, a paint by number oil painting thing. I stole the oil paints out of it and tried to paint something. You know, I was reading comic books at the time, these old horror comic books, and the covers that they had on the magazines were oil paintings. I mean, I loved reading the comic books and the stories. It was all horror-related stuff. I was just drawn to those covers because they were, obviously, they were on photographs. They were something that somebody thought up and drew and then painted, and that was the cover. I thought, I, I want to do that. Where do you think your obsession with that genre comes from? Oh, that's easy. You know, my dad was a horror movie guy. He claimed I was five and he sat me down and we watched Frankenstein together on a little black and white TV. He said, oh, I could tell within five minutes you were hooked. And then you were drawing Frankenstein on everything. Plus I also had my dad's sister, my aunt. She used to buy horror comics. Books. And she would read them, and then when she was done with them, she gave them to me. I got those and looked, it's like, these guys are drawing comics? They, they must get paid to do this. You mean you can make a living drawing monsters? Holy shit, that's what I want to do. I'm 62, I'm still painting Frankenstein. <laughs> and you know, every other horror movie I kind of could think of. I got a job in a screen print shop when I was 13 to do artwork. So I sat and drew the designs that were gonna get printed on t-shirts. I still had to go to school, so I wouldn't get to the shop till like three o'clock in the afternoon. And I had to do all of the artwork for like the next day's printing. And they taught me the entire business from the ground up. And I worked there for 20 years, learned as much as I could, and then went off on my own to just do artwork. So then I, I found that little stupid set of oil paints that my mom had and I tried to paint something, but I didn't really take it seriously till I was like 45. I entered some, you know, fair art shows once in a while, but you know, there was no comic cons or con horror movie conventions. There wasn't the internet. So the ability for other people to see what you were doing was like almost zero. So when you first started, you had the intent of creating comic book covers? A comic book covers or like movie posters. Right. Was that almost like your thought of the scale of success? When I was 45, I actually went to a horror movie convention with my dad and my brother. And there was a guy there that had horror movie paintings. My brother, Ron, pointed it out. He said, I don't know why you don't do that. You could pay better than that guy. That's freaking brilliant. Why don't I? So at that point, I said, well, you know what? I'm 45. If I'm gonna take this seriously and actually try to do something with it, now's the time. And I thought if I could just get published, that would be my benchmark of success. And I gave myself five years. And in my fifth year, I got my first magazine cover. So it, it took those five years. It took those five years. I just happened to be at a convention in Pittsburgh and I was out back and this guy was out there, asked me what I was doing there. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a painter. What do you do? He says, oh, I, I publish Scarlet Film Magazine. And he asked me where my booth was. I said, oh, I'm just right down the hallway there. I'm the classic horror guy. And he was like, oh, you're that guy. I'd really like you to do a cover for us. I know when I went back to my table and I had my and I had my brother with me, I told him, I'm actually gonna get published. I'm gonna do what I set out to do when I was 10. That story of you painting, I think it was that original Frankenstein, you said that you've painted it numerous times, but there's that one. I kind of want you to tell that story. For artists that are trying to do this for a living, that could also be some form of inspiration that, you know, you can take 10,000 photos, but that one photo might be what really sells and- Launches helps. you. Yes, launch. Sure. So I'd love to hear that story again. You know, I decided I was gonna go do some horror movie conventions. I thought it would be fun. I'm gonna take Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman and, and all those things. And I'm gonna paint my version of what I think they would look like in color. Well, Frankenstein was, I think, the first one I did, especially for my skill set at the time. It came out really, really well. Took that to shows and had prints made. I sold tons of them. For some reason, that one particular piece got a ton of, of attention and sort of put me on the map. 
But I always feel like, well, Frankenstein was the thing that got me noticed. So I always have to have a Frankenstein painting in my collection to take to shows. Had I not done that particular piece, had it not come out the way that it did, would I have achieved the pretty moderate level of success that I have? I don't know. I kind of got to give props to Frankenstein. Once they saw that piece, then they saw the other ones. Then you have a body of work and people will come up to my booth at my table, my display and say, oh, there's the classic horror guy. Eventually, I just came to, okay, my company name is Classic Horrors. What do I do? Classic Horror. I seldom do anything that's, you know, like even after 1980. I let everybody else do the new stuff. I do all the older things. Of course, I got a Halloween painting sitting right there, but that, that's a commission that I'm doing for somebody. You doing the Classic Horror work on something like oil painting, it just gives it more, uh, in a sense, like a story. For lack of a better term, it's like the accepted traditional medium. All the great master painters painted in oils, which is why I chose that when I was younger. So I thought, well, that's gotta be the coolest medium to do, because if Rembrandt was using oils, I wanna use oils. So I grew up doing that. and. I'm doing traditional art with traditional medium in the traditional way, and that's my lane. That's interesting. It, it seems like everything was almost destined for you to go the dumbest path. It is luck. I happened to be there. I found that. I lived in a town with a print shop. They hired me. Don't know why. I couldn't draw with the shit. The comic books and going to conventions and running into somebody, and then you get that opportunity to do something, then just don't screw it up. If I'd have been standing out there at that show at Pittsburgh and this guy asked me what I was doing and I just didn't feel like being terribly social and didn't want to talk to him, I never would have got my first magazine cover 150 published pieces of artwork ago. So I look at that as good luck. Not that I was so good yeah. that they just had to have me do their cover. No, at the time, I wasn't. I think it's one of those things though too where it is also based on luck, but you also have to have the skill to even be in that position to have that luck. You have to have a basic skill, yes, obviously, and you also have to have the desire to do your best work. It's one of my fears too, is like, I don't want to be an artist that anyone's <laughs> going to look at it. It's like, Psh, I could do that. Yeah, but you know, there's a whole thing there. I paint what I want to paint, and I paint how I want to paint it. I'm doing these paintings, they're for me. You can't look at something and think to yourself, I'm going to paint something that I think people are going to buy. That's not the right inspiration. I do it for me. Now, that being said, I absolutely love it when other people like it, but that's secondary. If someone comes and looks at my artwork and they go, eh, I don't really care for that. Well, that's okay. Every artist has their own style. And if you don't like my style, well, you know, that guy over there, he's got something different. If you like his, that's cool. I don't take it personally. You know, your tastes aren't the same as everybody else's taste. And I have a very specific way of looking at what I do. If I do a piece and if it doesn't make me happy, then I don't really want anybody else to see it. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I love it when people are at my table buying my stuff and commenting and want to see my artwork. That, that's the greatest, one of the greatest feelings in the world, where people are actually appreciating what you do. You're giving them a little bit of enjoyment. You know, if you're a horror movie convention, well, they're into horror movies. And they see what you do and they like it. And then you can talk about movies, the ones you like, the ones you don't like. You can have this whole discussion. I mean, a lot of work goes into going to these shows. Pack up the van, sometimes drive five, six, seven, eight hours someplace, unload it, set it up, stand it for three days. It's a a lot of work. Sure, I'm there because I need to make some money. It is a business. I have to pay for the trip and buying new supplies and getting new shirts and, and all that stuff. But once I'm there and the show starts and people coming in, it's not about the money. It's about talking to people about a subject that you're all there for. When I'm going to go to a show, one of my first thoughts is, okay, what city am I going to and who am I going to see there? You know, what friends do I have that I only see in Pittsburgh? And that's a big part of what makes the whole effort worth doing. Just having those conversations with people as well. I think that is so important in and of itself. You get to learn other people's point of views. With street photos and stuff, that even impacted my art. Just having those conversations with people. Sure. I mean, me. gain inspiration from a lot of different things. Because of the conventions I do, I know a lot of other artists. Like I'll look at a, a friend of mine artwork and I go, God, I wish I could do that. But then he'll come over and look at mine and go, God, how do you do? I wish I could do that. Because it's so different. Sometimes it's famous established artists that have really been in the field will come over and look at, at something I did. And like, how did you do that? You've been doing this for 20 years longer than me. You should know. I can't teach you anything. But you get inspiration. Absolutely. And you learn little tricks. 
just like what you said though, like you're always learning. The day you stop learning in the field and you think you know it all, that's when you move on to something new. No matter how famous and established someone is, if they are drawn to your work and there's a technique that you did, they might want to learn it to implement it in theirs as well. Uh, you've been doing it for long enough and you've reached enough success to where you can just choose what you want to do. I am very lucky. You know, people will ask me about commissions all the time. And if it's something that I want to do, if it's a, a movie that I like or a character I like or an actor that I like, I'd love to do it. But if it's a movie that I hate, I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to do a great job on it. You know, when someone asks me to do a commission, you know, I'll get the movie. I'll watch the movie. What are the cool aspects of the movie that I think would make a really cool image? I I kind of look at it as I'm doing my own version of a movie poster. Again, going back to the comic books, they had a logic to them. There was an image, there was a masthead, there were columns on both sides for articles and words. All of my paintings, there's a spot for all that. It's on purpose because that's the aesthetic I grew up with. That's my process. I mean, I start every painting. I don't know how it's going to turn. I don't usually start with a preconceived notion of what it's going to be. I have the drawing. I mean, that's like my source material that I put together. That's what I'm using. And I do these in black and white for a purpose because I let the color make up itself. I don't decide, okay, I'm going to use blue and green on it. I just sort of let it happen on its own so that when it's done, I look at it and go, oh, that's not at all what I thought it was going to be. So I went to Yonkan with Mary. We're walking around and I'm looking at everyone's different art. I would say 90% of the artists were just sitting there doing their art and people were walking right by them. But the people that were engaging and commenting, whether it was on your cosplay or if they were just up and talking to you about their process, it made such a massive difference. And people actually stuck around that booth, picked up their art, their stickers, whatever it was, and they were making sales. Or at the very least, got a business card and they're gonna go follow them on Instagram and maybe buy something from them later. But if you're an artist and you go to their table, yep, they got the earbuds on, they're looking down and they're drawing in their sketchbook. They got a little pile of homemade business cards, no banner, no tablecloth. It looks like you just rolled out of bed this morning and decided you were gonna throw some crap on a table and come here. And then you wonder, well, geez, I spent $500 on a table here and I only made a hundred bucks. You can be all artsy fartsy all you want to when you're in your process. But if you're being paid or if you're trying to sell, don't fool yourself. It's a business. And if you ignore that, you're gonna get your ass handed to you. I came up with some rules very, very early. I don't have a chair behind my table. I stand because that puts me at eye level with people. And when people walk by and if they look at me, I would say, hey, hi, how are you doing? They come to my table, they take a step forward. You just start talking to them. You have to be approachable. You have to be friendly. You have to be talkative. The problem is, is that the vast majority of creative people, artists, or maybe the worst, are very introverted. I was naturally the same way. I was a very shy person 20 years ago, but that's not gonna work. I basically live on returning customers coming to my table to see the new stuff that I have, my new paintings, my new t-shirts, my new enamel pins. The more of those kind of people gravitate to you mm -hmm. if you're open to that. You, you perpetuate your own success. That Frankenstein painting that I did that got me noticed, that one piece of artwork that I spent like two weeks on, that's a 15 year revenue stream. These guests that like my work, the business side is those people are my revenue stream. The fact that they come back show after show after show after show and buy my stuff again and again and again. As a business, you kind of have to look at it that way. You will do a painting, but then you'll take that painting and put it on shirts, mugs, pins, pine glasses. So I would just love to understand that process of how you got to where you are now. When I first started, I had my original paintings and I had these really cheesy prints. Mm -hmm. That was it. Because I didn't have any money. So you start with what you could do. I'll print a t-shirt and see. I could sell them. I don't know, I printed like 50 t-shirts and they were like gone by noon. Okay, well I just quadrupled what I made. Ooh, that's a good idea. I went from one t-shirt to, you know, now I generally carry around a dozen different designs. And then I look around, I look at conventions, I, I, I search the internet. What else can I put my artwork on? The pint glasses, that's a fairly new thing. I work part-time at Halloween store and the other lady that works there, she knows how to do acid etching on glass. I thought, you know, I've been thinking about glasses. So it's because I have a personal connection that I have her do that. I like to have people that I know do things. 
I'd rather give my money to her than PayPal somebody on the internet that I don't know. To me, that makes more sense. I have more control over it. You have a relationship. Sometimes I see something at someone else's table and I thought, oh, that's perfect for me. Change it a little bit. I don't want to steal someone's idea. There's a little bit of research. There's some common sense and it's what fits for you. You have to experiment. You know, I've done stuff that people looked at and went, eh. It's like, oh, I got 500 of those. I designed a whole set of trading cards. I did like 60 different trading cards. I thought they turned out great. They kind of went, eh. No one was that interested in Stephen Bama Classic Horror trading cards. So I just start giving them white hits. A little kid comes to the table and goes, oh, this is so cool. Oh, well, here you go. Here's a card. They'll run off to their mom or dad and go, look what I got. Look what I got. And they'll come back. Oh, these are really nice. Good. Can I have one of those t-shirts? <laughs> Sometimes stuff sells and sometimes it just doesn't. I'm sure you have a personality when you're behind the booth. Normally a fairly quiet person. I listen to music, I read books, I paint. The show starts at four and they start letting people in. I, I actually will go four o'clock. It's showtime. You come to my table. I want to entertain you. I want you to walk away and say to yourself, this classic horrors guy, the guy was funny as hell. Or, you know, he told some great stories or had a great time. I'll go back to him you know, the next time I see him and get some. He was great. It's not like going to Walmart, go in there, buy your shit and get out. I'm trying to sell you an experience. I want you to have a good time when you come to my table. If you're at a convention, if you're at that setting, you're there for the experience. I want to be one of those people that years later, you're like, yeah, I met this really cool guy. Look, I got this t-shirt from him and this print to remember you fondly and to want to come and talk again. So the next time you're in town and you say, hey, Steve, how are you doing? It's like an old friend. That's how I look at the whole experience. That's the convention persona. I dress up. I wear a jacket, I wear a tie, I have specific clothes that I wear to shows to make me stand out. Well, do you know what? Just that little bit is what might make them stop at my table. Once they see the work, they go, wow, I love that t-shirt, that's cool. It's, it's a lot of little intangible things that add up to become successful. And none of them are particularly hard to do. Ever since I was a kid, it's always been negative. Well, you can't paint monsters. That's great, you can't make a living out of that. Nobody gets to do that, that's nuts. I'm just stupid enough and just stubborn enough to go, well, I'll show you. You don't need to be some A-list painting celebrity in order to make a living nope. either. I am not an A-list celebrity. <laughs> I am not well known. I am not famous in any way, shape, Perform, but over the last 20 years, I've made a living out of painting and commissions and being published. I've met people that will have 300 followers on social media, but yet they are making hundreds of thousands doing videography and they're running a successful business. And I've also met people vice versa where they have 90, 100,000 followers and they can't even sell prints. You don't necessarily have to have that social media following, but a little bit of engagement and also business. I mean, I don't think you have to be great at all of those things. I think you have to be pretty competent at all of those things. If you have a good personality and you can talk to people, hey, that's great. If you're really good at what you do, and then if you have just a little bit of common sense to handle basic business, that's all you need. But you know, if you had two of those three, you'd probably be somewhat successful. I'm on all the social media platforms. But I do have an Etsy site and it's a uh, classic Horrors 13 at Etsy. I mean, you can find me at almost every horror movie convention or Comic-Con locally. <laughs> How was that? Was that all right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay.